Hello, everybody. Um, we're starting our panel discussion. And so the focus for this final segment of the field day is to talk about some of the interactions between livestock management and control of predators and then how that relates to conservation. So we have with us today, um, very excited to share that we have a few, a couple of folks from the Missouri Department of Conservation. Uh, Laura Conley, who's a fur bearer biologist with MDC, and we have Josh Wisdom, who is a wildlife damage biologist. We also have Petros Christafis, who is in Cal joining us from California, I believe. Um, he is part of an initiative, or started the initiative, the Predator Detection and Deterrence Initiative, and so we're going to hear from him. And then finally, we're really happy to welcome Hank Hainzinger, who is a board member of um, Osage Nation Ranch and is a rancher himself as well. So um, Dusty Walter will also be hopping in and chatting about his role as superintendent at LORC and um, any, answering any questions about WordAx grazing management and predator interactions. So welcome to our panelists. Thank you so much for making time. And um, hopefully the goal of this is really to be a very open discussion. And um, we're hoping to get a lot of questions from the audience as well. So what I'm hoping to do today is, is start out and have you all introduce yourself better than I can and share a little bit about what you do in your respective organizations and just a brief overview of, of where your, what your experiences are with predators and livestock management. And then I have a few questions in the bank, but if anybody in the audience has questions at any time, um, I'll do our best to pose those and prioritize those for the panelists first. Um, and we can just we can have a really neat chat, I hope. So um, Petros, why don't we start off with you? Sure. Hi, everyone. So I'm Petros. Um, I'm in California. I started my own uh, research projects, our organization called Predator Detection and Deterrence. Um, I'm mostly focused on trying to help ranchers implement non-lethal tools and non-lethal measures to protect their livestock against uh, the predators that we have here. It's mostly coyotes and mountain lions. Um, there's some wolves in Northeast and there's a couple randomly moving around in California, which is exciting, uh, but most of the depredation happened from mountain lions and uh, coyotes. So my, my, most of my work is I usually get uh, asked to go to a ranch um, or to go to a livestock operation. Um, I go in and talk to them. We go through the options of what's happening. We troubleshoot um, what happened, if there's a depredation or if there's a fear of depredation. Um, and then we move from there. We implement different measures, try and see what works for this particular operation and what doesn't. And we just kind of move from there. Um, I don't do any lethal control myself. I do do trapping for the smaller animals and then relocate, but that's that's pretty much to the extent of, of where I um, where I dabble in that. Most of the work is just giving the ranchers the proper resources. I have loaner kits out that I can give to people during lambing season or calving season, um, so they can have the appropriate measures without busting into the bank and you know having to make this. Um, the, the monetary um, effort to, to protect their livestock. And then I'm doing some research on new ways to protect livestock. So I'm doing a scent study. We're using a lot of common household scents that you know indicate there's a, a human in the area. We're trying to replicate the idea that there's a human in the area without there actually being one using scents. And so far it's been kind of a mixed bag, but it's very interesting result. Wonderful. Hank, would you mind sharing, introducing yourself next? No, uh, my name's Hank Haines here from the Osage County. A uh, little back history, the Osage Nation, we have a 47,000 acre ranch. Uh, we run about 2,500 cows, uh, about 700 yearlings and about 120 bison. And uh, we, uh, we actively, you know, we're, we're working on predator control 24 seven, uh, the wild pigs, it seems to be our worst enemy on the, uh, on the ranch, uh, coyotes. Uh, I've always been told there's two kinds. There's a, there's a scavenger and there's a predator and we seem to be able to handle the predator ones. You know, you'll catch them, but the scavenger ones are, you know, pretty much they're They don't, they just kind of keep the ground clean, but the pigs, the pigs create a huge problem. Um, 
we've controlled them lethally as much as we can. The, the trapping, you can't get ahead of some of the, uh, the big, the big litters of them, you know, you'll catch four or five out of 50, you know, and, and you're just, you just can't get ahead. But, uh, we've had a pretty good, uh, pretty good success with, uh, lethally controlling them from the air and, uh, kind of pinned them back, uh, one year we didn't have a lot of trouble last year but the two years before that we was having but they're they're, they're detrimental to uh to everything they uh they tear up our hay meadows and uh they i've known them to uh go in after a young calf that you know just fresh born calf you know they'll 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 take them and uh but yeah the 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 pigs are the biggest problem that we faced we don't have no uh no lion problems or or bobcats or anything like that to seem to be any problem, but uh, just the the wild hogs is uh, the biggest problem that we've faced. It's just the destruction that they can do in a short time, you know. So, uh, but yeah, that's that's uh, that's that they have created a problem. Yeah, I I'm sure many people on this call are familiar with this struggles with the wild pigs. So I'm hoping that we'll get some questions and, and have a conversation about those. Um, Laura, would you mind going next? Sure, so my name is Laura Conley. I'm the fur bear and black bear biologist for Missouri Department of Conservation. Um, and so I'm basically charged with um, monitoring and managing our state's fur bear and bear population. So a lot of research and monitoring efforts, um, as well as setting harvest regulations and things like that. Um, so kind of I can touch on all the specifics from the population perspective and the biology and stuff like that. Um, and I'll let Josh cover kind of where MDC falls in terms of um, nuisance response and those kinds of things. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Josh. So uh, my name is Josh Wisdom. I'm actually the, the southwest corner of Missouri, so parts of my region touch Arkansas and Oklahoma both. Uh, as a department, we have six full-time damage biologists, and we're there as, as a couple of different roles. One is just information, you know, what we give insight to the public. A lot of it has to do with scale. You know, the gentleman earlier talked about how big his ranch was, and we've got people that most of ours are anywhere from, you know, a 10 acre farm to 300 acres. You know, we don't have a lot of really, really big landowners. And so a lot of these people are just kind of farming beyond their day job. Uh, so, so if they lose one cow, it's really the end of the world in their eyes. I mean, I understand it's a financial loss, but it, it seems like they're way more excited about it than some other people. But I mean, we run any, Missouri is a huge cow calf state. I deal a lot with those. Sheep and lambs are a growing, uh, a growing thing here in Missouri. This is continuing to increase. Uh, the, we, we earlier in the, on your uh, event today, we had the gentleman talking about bees. Bees continue to grow in Missouri. So, I mean, I run the gamut from coyotes, feral hogs, black bears and apiaries, black vultures on calves, uh, all the way to, you know, there's a raccoon that keeps getting in my chicken coop and I don't know what to do it. So, so you know, we, we're kind of in that interface of people that are as rural as you can be in, in Missouri that are completely surrounded by forest service on, on all four sides to people that are literally just outside the city limit sign. Wonderful, thank you. Well, we have a, a range of perspectives coming in. We have folks who are working in conservation specifically, folks that are working in production. We have just a lot of overlap. Um, Dusty, would you mind popping in and, and refreshing folks if, if, if anybody new is popping in about who you are and what your role is at work? Well, certainly. Uh, my name is Dusty Walter and I am superintendent of a couple of research centers, co-superintendent of Land of the Osages, and then superintendent of the WordAC Research Center, which is down in the south central part of the state by Steelville, Missouri. Um, that, on that area, we are primarily a cow-calf operation with also a lot of timber on the property. Then at uh, Land of the Osages, my original interest in, in predators came looking at bobwhite quail. So a little different than livestock, but, but certainly interested in, in predation and impact on quail populations potentially, and, and specifically I would guess on, on nesting opportunities there. Uh, but most recently we've, we're getting ready to implement a, a study utilizing goats down there. And so then, then you start thinking, uh, 
about coyotes and maybe even some some dogs in the area and so that type of predation uh, as well you know i'll just throw this caveat in there that all across the state we recognize that that with an abundant deer herd uh, and comes some other predators moving it migratorily into the area like mountain lions um, and i've even seen some some guys on game cameras capture black bears getting into some of their deer feeders that they use in off seasons. So all of those factors play a role. Um, and uh, in my educational background is in forestry. So, I, <laughs> so I'm a little bit like a fish out of water. And, uh, but at the same time, it's relevant to everything we do on the land that we manage. Uh, it just depends perspective, um, which farm I'm on as to how, I'm, how I treat predators or what I view as a predator even, so. Thanks, Dusty. And I think you bring up a good point about like when you say what, who and what you view as a predator and, and how that word is, is a kind of a loaded word in itself that it's, it's kind of like weed, you know, a weed is just a plant where we don't want it. And, and, um, and I think that that really starts this discussion off, I think, in a place where we're kind of trying to balance how do we protect the livestock that we're raising while also being able to appropriately manage the wildlife that also shares this, this same space in this land, you know? Um, so I wanted, all of you have kind of started off and, and touched on some of the, the main animals and species that you're dealing with, but I wanna kind of go around and start getting into some of the details. Um, I'm learning in this just as much as I think some other folks. So I'm curious to hear a more specifically about what are, the, what are the primary predators that are of concern or that you run into in your area and how specifically are you, are you approaching that? Has that approach changed over the years? Have you found that some strategies work better or needs have changed and um, you've had to shift strategies a little bit? Um, Josh, why don't we go ahead and start with you? What have you seen in your work with MDC about um, strategies and, and species? Well, uh, again, it all kind of is relative. Uh, I, knew, I will say, you know, coyotes are always a big thing, you know, because coyote eat a chicken, coyote eat a cat, Dusty hit a, a big thing. In Missouri, for a lot of our incidents, honestly, it's usually feral dogs, the neighbor's dogs, somebody's coonhounds got out. I've seen, or I've seen dogs kill piles of sheep in a, in a pen before, and I mean, obviously, it's a big loss, but we have a lot of dog issues, and people hate to say that, they hate to think that's true, but oftentimes it's their own dog or a dog that they know, uh, you know, oh, my dog wouldn't do that except for when you're not there and you're at work during the day and the dog goes crazy. So dogs are really common. Uh, Missouri, I'll just have to touch on it. We've liberalized our coyote season, our methods of take uh, as about as liberal as we can get. And a lot of that is from public outcry. Uh, this past year, we, for the first time ever in February and March, we now have a 24 hour a day season. So for those two months out of the year, landowners could use thermal imaging devices, spotlights, night vision without any type of permitting at all. Uh, so that's after deer have already dropped their antlers. So it makes like poaching for bucks way less likely. Uh, beyond that, we still have a 365 day a, season, day a year season, but in those two months, they can use anything 24 hours a day. Uh, you know, we have a trapping season from November through January that will be recreational trapping. We also have a program that the damage biologists and the agents administer where we do allow snaring with a permit. And so that's a big part of my job is showing people how to snare. And, and where I'm going with that is typically we recommend snares hanging off the bottoms of fences. So if you've got coyotes going through a fence and what that ties into that's more important is basically good fences will fix 99% of all the problems that we have with these. Whether it's electric fences to keep bears out or just good tight fences that are keeping coyotes out or whatever fencing is really the key. Uh, you know, the people want to remove wildlife lethally. It's just kind of a, a human nature just to kill it and be done with it. But the conversation I have over and over and over again is you will never kill every coyote that's out there. There will always be more next year. It will just continue and continue and continue. And so instead of just chasing your tail, just make good, what I call defensible area, which is something they use in the forest fighting uh, world, but you know, whether you've got good fences, you got electric, you've got lights, you've got guard dogs, you, you're moving them closer to the house when they're more vulnerable, et cetera. Uh, defendable space is a big thing that I really try to, to hit home anymore. 
Or do you have any anything to add? Yeah, I was going to say too, you know, one of the things that we contend with a lot too is kind of dispelling myths and, and helping folks understand what the issues actually are that they're seeing. So we do have the occasional mountain lion that comes through Missouri and uh, and we've got bobcats here. We have the occasional wolf that comes into Missouri and we've got an established and growing bear population. Um, so we have multiple incidents a year where somebody finds something and they jump to the conclusion that a lion did it or a bear did it. And so we we have a team, Josh is one of those, that goes out and responds to those kinds of things where we can look and determine, okay, what is the likely culprit here or rule out some of those things. And we've never had a lion um, confirmed depredation here or or a bear confirmed depredation here on cattle. But uh, a lot of that comes down to, again, the, the dogs, like Josh said, we've, we've had a lot of instances where somebody thinks it's a lion and it ends up being a, a dog. We've had instances where bobcats get in and um, will kill sheep or goats and, and stuff like that too. Um, so a lot of what we do is kind of in response to that. And the, the more instances we have with lions coming into the state. I think there's a lot of folks that that hear about it and they they kind of get concerned about it and think about it. So we do a lot of educating with respect to that. And those site visits are really good opportunities for staff to provide that guidance and, and things like that. Um, and then with our growing bear population, we're in this constant um, never ending education phase. Basically bears are a new thing for so many people and, um, and we have bears that break into chicken coops and will get into beehives or get into livestock feed in the barn and stuff like that. And so there's kind of this, you know, this constant increase in education related to it too. And I think that is equally as important as the actual, you know, mitigation response that we can do in those situations too. So just kind of adding to it. Yeah. So and again, we have a range of, of, of regions and parts of the US. So Hank, I know you had kind of touched on uh, some of the issues with borders that you guys have. Can you talk about how you all manage predators at Osage Nation Ranch? Well, the, 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 way, that, uh, the way that we've currently been handling the, the feral hog population is with helicopters by air, um, with uh, rifles or, and, uh, but like I said, those, the pigs are a huge problem and you can, you can knock them back for a year or so and then they're going to be right back. You can't ever, you can't really never get ahead of them, but all you can do is kind of try to control them somewhat. Uh, but you know, they, they talk about the, the pigs and I'll tell you something else, the beavers are starting to become a problem in our, in our stock ponds, you know, chewing holes through our stock ponds. Uh, seems like there's more beaver damage than there has been in the past in the last 10 years. But, uh, but the pigs and the, the coyotes hasn't created a huge problem. Uh, you know, the, uh, they kind of take care of themselves as far as, you know, uh, getting hit on highways and, and roads and, you know, like that. But, uh, but the pigs, it, it, it seems like they know when there's a car coming in and, and if a car hits a hog, it's, it, tears the car up you know i mean there's you hit a 80 pound object that's it's like hitting a cement block and uh you see a hog hit on a road you'll see a broke down car on down the just a little ways from it you know but uh but yeah the the air has been the best way that we have controlled our deal i mean there's no way that we can fence anything out you know i mean our ranch is about eight miles long and and uh you know, it's, it's 10 miles from one side to the other. And, you know, it's just, it's just a big place with a few guys looking after things, you know, and, and, uh, it's the air thing has been the, the helicopter with the, with the guns and, and you can, you can knock a, quite a lot of them down at one time and kind of make a dent in them. But, uh, they're just, they just keep, uh, you know, they'll never stop. They're going to keep working their way northward. I, I'm going to say they're probably in every state in the union. Uh, I guess they're, are they in California? You know, the, the wild pigs, you know? Uh, so, and, and I don't know what anybody's got a good solution to, to fix them, you know, 
So I'm, we're open for suggestions, but the traps, like I said, the traps will work. You know, you get a, a herd of 50 pigs and you might get five of them trapped in the trap. And, uh, you know, they say, well, that's the way to do it. Well, man, when you're just knocking a, a tenth of them out of, out of a herd, you know, you're not, you're not getting anywhere very fast. So a drop in the bucket. It's just a drop in the bucket, you know? So, yeah, but the, the wild pigs, the wild pigs are the, the biggest problem that we have here on the ranch. All right. Petros, um, I know you had kind of, again, touched on what, a little bit of what you do, but what are, what are the biggest predator issues out in California and how do you, how do you manage them? So, I mean, pigs are a problem as they are pretty much everywhere in the U.S. There's no leaf, non-lethal way to deal with them. Um, they don't care about any, anything, any other strategies that all the other predators deal with. So the only way that you can deal with them is really just to, like shoot them. Um, that's how that works. Um, they are they are an issue, especially in the foothills of the mountains, um, and they because especially water is pretty precious in California. They do erode a lot of the, the water areas. They damage streams and they damage stuff. So um, that's usually usually that's a problem that takes care of itself. You know, like most ranchers have have an awareness of like, hey, shoot the pigs. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, I do deal with some black bears, although my black bear um, conflict situation is more with campers leaving food around or um, anything uh, anything of the sort. They don't typically they're not typically responsible for depredation, uh, mostly because there's a lot of food for them out there, so they don't really want to deal with getting any of the sheep or the goats or the cows. Uh, mountain lions and coyotes. Coyotes are uh, in California. They're considered non-game. If you have a hunting license, you can shoot them. Um, but there are, there's a lot of a bigger push, especially to try and get, um, to try and use non-lethals to manage them. Um, they do successfully respond to a few, a few things, but they're very adaptable creatures. So they always keep you on your toes. Um, I found that lifestyle guardian dogs tend to be the best because they, that represents a constant change in their habitat. So, sorry, my cat decided to kind of be chatty. Um, Mountain lions are a different thing. They're protected in the state of California. There's no hunting or trapping them. Um, there's no trapping in California, uh, period, except for pigs. Um, but um, they're a different different situation. If you get three, diff three depredations in your ranch, you're allowed to apply for a depredation permit, in which case you can have either the state or federal go out and uh, you have 10 days to shoot that mountain lion. Um, some people will do it themselves, but it is it's 10 days out of your work, essentially, uh, trying to find a mountain lion. And since you're not allowed to use hound, there's a, you know, a different situation. So that's where most of my calls are, um, especially with a lot smaller operations, hobby farmers or hobby ranchers that have like some animals at homestead and then, you know, decide that they're going to um, deal with this problem. So mountain lions respond very well to fox lights. So that's one of the things that we, we found to be like, it's just little... Usually you can do solar or power batteries like, and they represent someone walking in a field with a torch. So that, that emulates that light. Um, and they do tend to respond very well to that. It does depend on how, that's the problem that is emerging in California is you have a lot of urban centers, even, even remote areas are tend to be highly populated. So it depends on what the animals have been exposed to. And we have a lot of animals that are exposed to lights, cars, noises all the time. So these things that would work in remote areas of the woods for that particular population don't work on the predators that are on the fringe of like the urban environment. So it's a constant, which is why I think this is also fun for me as well, but it's a constant like problem solving situation where you have to figure out what to do. And uh, since mountain lions can, cannot be shot most of the times, or, you know, if you are waiting for three depredation permits, you've already lost like a lot of money. Um, so usually within the first depredation, I get called on the scene to, to try and deal with it before there's more, more loss from the ranchers. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Got a little predator of your own there. <laughs> um, yeah. so we do, we do have a couple of questions that are coming in. So I'm going to start off with Nirtana actually, um, their question, I think Josh, this was about when you were talking about the coyote year, year round hunting season. Could you explain? Uh, they ask, what is the year round hunting season? I assume so, that means for Missouri. Yep, yeah, for Missouri, for coyotes, again, if you have a hunting license, which I think is probably $10 now just for a regular hunting license. Yeah, but for coyotes, there's no limit. 
and it's year round, uh, daylight to dark. The exception would be in turkey season, in the spring turkey season, you'd have to use a shotgun. Uh, but it's kind of what, what Petros was talking about. It's, all, it's, it's still a game animal, but it's very liberalized, very lenient on methods of take and that kind of thing. Uh, like I said, some states even consider them a varmint that have you know, no measures over them at all, but we do have some. Uh, like I said, so basically it's a year round season. If people want to go out there and call and try to shoot coyotes or, you know, if, if they keep a, some people just keep a gun in their tractor on the farm or whatever, there's just a year round season. Uh, there's, there's no shortage of time to take a coyote. All right. Thank you. Um, I hope that answered your question, Nirtana. Uh, we also have a question from Summer LaRose and she asks, can tight fencing negatively impact non-target species or wildlife communities across the broader landscape? Um, Laura, do you want to tackle that question first? Yeah, I can try. So I think, you know, from the Missouri perspective here, my answer would probably be no, we're not likely to see impacts at that level, um, mostly because the, you know, the areas that would have this tight fencing, they're not super huge acreages, and it's certainly not continuous. So, you know, as Josh talked about, you know, anything from those 10 acre farms all the way up to those several hundred acre farms, um, you know, they're not in blocks across the uh, the board or anything like that. And so there's spaces between. And so, you know, I think in that instance, there's, you know, at the local scale, at that very, very local scale. Um, yeah, there's probably some instances where that very tight fencing could potentially impact movement for certain species, um, but kind of at the broader scale. And, and for me, you know, I, I don't deal with most of the little, you know, like I do, mammals and fur bears really. So from the fur bear perspective, no, I don't really see any negative impacts um, in, in that sense. Uh, but I think here the setup doesn't necessarily allow it for that. We don't see just such a continuous um, area that would be fenced that that would likely be um, problematic. Can I also touch on that a bit? There are types of fencing that exclude particular animals from an area, so we we have um, we have coyote exclusion fences and, and bobcat exclusion fences for kit foxes, but there's small enough holes that the kit fox can go through uh, that stops the coyotes or the bobcats, which predate on the kit fox, uh, to do it. And then you can also leave strategic gaps for the larger ungulates to go through, but also like excluding coyotes and bobcats. So there are different kinds that you can you can do depending on what you have on your on the area that you want to exclude or allow in the, in the area. Josh, do you have any thoughts to add to that question? Uh, not really. I think Laura kind of hit it. You know, in Missouri, we don't have too many like kit foxes, things that are really endangered, threatened per se. So it's not as big of an issue. You know, when I'm talking about tight fences, I'm talking about like welded wire or mesh netting fences. So even then, a raccoon or a possum can still slide through that four or six inch square, but but a coyote's not going through it. It's generally what we're talking about. Most of our fences at the tallest would be five foot tall. And so even then a deer could jump it if, if they wanted to, if they needed to, but it's just keeping out most of those predators. And, uh, you know, a real good fence around here would be this, you know, the thing that might be an obstruction would be like a tight fence with like an outrigger on the bottom to keep a coyote from digging underneath it, something like that. But even then, yeah, you know, a, a raccoon can jump and climb that fence post or whatever. I just, it's just kind of a non-issue locally. Yeah. Um, and this, so this kind of segues into the idea of like protection and like deterrence type uh, measures. Um, Hank, have you guys, I know you said that you guys have a really large ranch and fences really aren't a thing. It's not totally possible for large areas, which I think is pretty common, right? You're not gonna fence in 8,000 acres, <laughs> sounds like a real bad day. So what other measures can ranchers take or have you guys tried that are more um, deterrence or protection measures for your herds? I'm thinking like guardian dogs or, or like spotlights or something. Have you tried anything and, and have you found yeah. that it works a little? We haven't tried anything else besides the deprivation or you know the, the extraction of them. But the, uh, the thing about it is our deal is, is huge you know very massive you know it's um lots of acres and and you know uh, we'll have 400 cows in one pasture you know i mean and you it would be hard to try to have a set of dogs that just look after 
you know, one pasture, you know, it's, it's uh, but the thing that where we feed cattle, we've got a uh, feedlot, a small feeding area, or I say it's small, it's a big set of pens. We can wean about 800 calves in there at a time, but um, we have a hog problem there and getting into our feed and then they will get in they will get in the pens at night and uh just uh a year ago we had the hogs get in there and they got to boogering the calves around and run them through a fence a, a pipe fence and uh but they'll get in there and and uh eat the feed you know from what the calves didn't use and they get to stirring them up and it, and it turned into a problem so what we done there was we ran a uh uh, wire a wire panel uh, I guess cattle panel for regular terms a cattle panel around the bottom of those lots and uh, and we had to put gates on the front front of our feed barns that we keep our feed loose in a in a barn we handle them mechanically handle all our feed mechanically to keep the hogs from going in there at night and uh, so you got to shut the barns up and and uh, keep the gates closed and keep every little Cranny wired up, you know, or you'll get pigs in there chasing, you know, messing with the calves at night. But uh, that's the only thing that we've tried to fence out. Uh, we haven't ever tried to, we've tried a few traps around in that small area, you know, to try to, you know, catch them. Uh, we've got one trap there that's, that's, uh, that's uh, set 365 days a year. And we'll go and, and every once in a while we'll have a pig that, that will get mingle his way in there and we'll have one trapped. But uh, when they come through that, when they make the, the wild pigs seem like they kind of make circles, you know, they've got a, they've got kind of a, uh, uh, rate, uh, a routine of where they go and, you know, they'll leave for, they'll be around for a few days and they'll drift off and they'll come back around in a little while, you know, a month later or something. But, but yeah, we always keep a trap set, but we're trying to control them to keep them out of our small feed confined area where we feed a lot of calves and uh, try to control them there as much as we can. But the, but the rest of the way out in the pastures with the pigs, you know, we, the deprivation thing, the, the extraction. Yeah, definitely. Petros, um, can you elaborate a little bit on some of the other like deterrent type strategies that you try and what, what do you find works better than others? Is there a threshold? Like you mentioned, the, the lights no longer being effective for cats that are close to urban areas. Um, can you just touch on some thoughts with that? Yeah, so when I talk to, to ranchers, um, I give them a little strategy plan, right? So it's always about rotating these tools. So the tools can go out for a couple of weeks and then you gotta change them. Otherwise you are habituating the animals to that particular tool. Um, so that's the, the important thing is we experiment with a couple of them. Um, there is a, a wonderful device called the Critter Gitter. It's a little thing, it's motion activated. It makes noise, it flashes lights, it scares the bejesus out of most of the animals. Uh, but it doesn't, it, if you leave it there for a month, then at some point they're gonna get used to it. Um, it's very common with like trail camera footage as well. You see the coyotes key it, they leave, but then they start getting closer and closer and that's their nature. Um, so I, I use a combination of fox lights. I use Fladry. It's popular with wolves, but if you space out the flags, if you make them shorter, it can work with coyotes, uh, electrified fencing, um, some overnight pens. Um, I'm touching on lifestyle guardian dogs. They're expensive and they require a lot of training. And that's just not something that I'm very comfortable um, touching on by myself. So we're working with other people right now to get it a much more viable thing, especially in California. And especially because it works a lot with mountain lions. So rotation, defensible spaces is also a term that I use a lot. Um, you got to know your land with water. If there's a water source that your cows are using or your sheep are using, then you, you focus your efforts there because that's where more likely the predators are going to come in as well to use water. And then there's an attack of opportunity there. You see the livestock and you're hungry and you go for it. So it's all about that we are experimenting with some ranchers in Northern California that have wolves now about husbandry practices to try and get the cows to be uh, less likely to run away from predators, because especially with the canine, it's all about triggering that hunt response when you're chasing, when they're chasing the cows. So they, they try and get the cows to chase, to run away so they can single out 
animals and, and hit them. So um, I, I use pretty much like I use uh, podcasts on a waterproof radio and I put them out, especially with mountain lions that works. If they hear human voices, they, they get out like it's nobody's business. And if you have podcasts with people that talk a lot and you've got like eight or 12 hours, that's, that's a, a big part of it too. Uh, there's a lot of great footage online of them, like eating a deer carcass and then hearing the voices trigger and then they get out immediately, uh, which is, it's funny, because especially considering how people get, are scared of mountain lions. Um, I also am very big on monitoring. It's a, a big thing, right? So um, one of the instances that I had was the, these uh, sheep get, keep getting hit by a mountain lion that would not stop. Uh, and I was, you know, I was at my wit's end. I had used everything possible and they were going to get a depredation permit. And then we found out that the lion had been injured. So they had a, a big injury on it in its paw. And so that pushes that lion to seek easier prey, which livestock tend to usually be easier. So keeping a tabs on the area, like it's all circumstantial. Obviously, if you have a giant uh, grazing allotment or a giant ranch, it's harder for you to keep tabs on all the areas. It's harder for you. It's a lot more work for the ranchers. Um, so hopefully, I, I at least in California, I try and mitigate some of that by doing the, the monitoring myself. But it's still a lot of work. It doesn't always work, but keeping an eye out on your population, knowing where your dens are, if you know coyote den sites or anything like that. And most people aren't out to kill them, but it is good to know if they've denned. It's good to know if they have pups because that's more pressure for them to seek out food and, and, and hit the livestock. So um, having the knowledge of the land, having the knowledge of the predators that are there is, is, is very key to that. Um, I promote the idea of allies a little bit as well. It's kind of like the devil you know. So I have a, a few ranches that have a mountain lion that's part of the, the ranch is part of the mountain lion's territory and they've named them. Uh, and those guys are big, usually big toms and they hang around and they shoo the younger toms around. But the older lions also know, or, or we know what scares them. We know what keeps them at bay from the livestock. So you have this, this predator who's defending essentially his territory in which your livestock are in but you also know, it's kind of the devil you know, like you know what scares them away. And that guy will, for at least a couple more years, keep the younger, more, um, uh, I wanna say ambitious lions at bay, which you know might not be deterred by the same things that this one is. So we're trying to do that. We're promoting that with Coyote Pact as well and um, touching on some wolf work and, and that's it, that's a, a, a deal there too, so. Interesting. Almost allowing them to to exhibit some of most some of their natural behaviors in that sense, but not not the not the really detrimental ones. Josh, did you have some additional thoughts? Well, I was going to say piggybacking on what he said. We also use the critter gator devices here in Missouri. Uh, there's another one that just came out in the market called a Gadfly that Margo Supply makes. Basically, the same thing, but it runs off a solar panel. So again, those are all motion activated devices. Uh, again, this is a, it's it's all circumstantial. It depends on the situation, but we've also used motion-activated sprinkler systems for stuff before. Uh, I mean, it's all there, you know. There's there's so many things out there anymore. There's motion-activated like you know inflatable guys that stand up that you know that you would see like in front of a used car lot or whatever. There's so many things out there. Uh, but he hit it right on the head. It doesn't matter if we're talking about Canada geese or coyotes or whatever. Things are only scary as long as they're new. And, and most of this harassment stuff, I tell people, is not difficult. It's just more work than most people want to do. It's not hard. It just requires some effort. Uh, another thing we see a lot, you know, black vultures in Missouri are, are a relatively new thing, and so are bears for that instance. And so the hardest conversation to have with a producer is that they may have to change the way they do business. Some of these farms are, quite frankly, overstocked. So there's literally nowhere for these cows to hide calves at on the property. So they stick out like a sore thumb. They get hammered by black vultures or whatever the case may be. It's like, well, that's not the way dad did it. Well, dad wasn't, you know, the things were different then. The landscape was different then. And that's a hard conversation for people to have that they may actually have to make, uh, you know, more paddocks, again, defendable space and move those cows around. And that's, that's a hard conversation to have. So you, you broached the topic of, of, of black vultures and, and this is something, so Dusty has brought it up in this in the chat here about, um, about problems with eagles and aerial predators are really a whole different bag, you know, because it's, you can't really fence out the air. So um, I'm gonna open this up to anybody who wants to pop in if you have thoughts on um, 
how best to deal with aerial predators? And are, are there certain strategies that you've found that are more effective? Uh, do you find the problem get getting worse? Like, are the populations growing? Are we going to have to change our strategies? Um, I'll leave it. I'll leave it kind of open. If anybody wants to jump in and, and offer their thoughts, the, I, we just noticed the black vultures in Oklahoma. I mean, starting to get ba bad. You know, I mean, you you see the little black headed ones, and you think, oh my god, you know, but they're mean. You know, I mean, they're 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 nasty, and I don't know what to do about them. I mean. I haven't had guys, you know, everybody's kind of starting to talk about them more, but uh, nobody's ever figured out anything really what to do about them. But they're daggone sure little mean little bird. I don't know yeah. where we're going to go with them. The short answer for black vultures specifically is effigies. And I, I realize you can't put an effigy up over eight square miles or whatever the case may be. Uh, but effigies do work. I deal with them, quite frankly, more on like residential properties that are lakefront properties than I do with, with producers, but we do deal with them with producers. Uh, you know, we've had them kill calves and we could talk about what that looks like. We've had them chase cows that have prolapse and eventually kill them or drown them because they run in the pond to get away from them, whatever. Uh, it happens in Missouri. It doesn't happen all day, every day, but it does happen. You also, I think, again, it's new to us, but you got to look at states like Florida, southern Oklahoma or southern Texas. They've had black vultures for years and they're still your biggest, you know, producers. So it's not the end of the world. I understand it's a financial loss and it's certainly a headache, uh, but it's not the end of the world. And so kind of tying the black vultures and the eagles thing back together. We do have some eagle loss here in Missouri. Uh, and if you want to say it's red tail hawks on chickens or eagles on lambs or whatever, Kind of your short answer is, yeah, unless there's some type of pin, you're probably going to have some losses. With the Eagles, it has its own layer of uh, legislation, federal protection, whatever you want to say, that makes it kind of a headache. Uh, I used to work for federal agencies, and I've done work on airports, and unless the rules have changed, we actually had to have a permit to intentionally harass Eagles back then. Mm -hmm. So if you were knowingly scaring an Eagle, shooting a gun in its general area, whatever, that had to be permitted on its own. Uh, that being said, in Missouri, it's legal to harass vultures of any kind. I'm saying I'm not saying you can knock feathers off of them, but you can harass those. Eagles are kind of special. Uh, there is a program uh, through your Farm Services Administration FSA office. It's called the uh, LIP Livestock Indemnity Program. So if you'll contact those people and go through their hoops, uh, there is some money available. At least it used to be in the last farm bill. I'm assuming it's still there. That it specifically was tied to aviation predators and wolves in states that reintroduced wolves. So there was some things for some financial recouping of that. But yeah, you know, I, uh, what's what I'm looking for here? Free range chickens is a big thing. Everybody likes that. And you just have to be frank with people. If you have a defenseless white bird that has nothing around it, something's probably going to eat it. And, and that's just the way it is. You're just going to have to include that loss into it. Again, that's way more difficult with lambs and sheep, but but yeah, it's kind of hard. The biggest thing I say, again, for vultures, effigies work. Beyond that, uh, almost every pasture I go to has some old dead snag tree in it that doesn't have a single leaf on it. And there might be one little stick of shade, just knock that down or burn it down. That's basically just being a perch for every big avian predator to sit from and look at stuff. Uh, you know, in really bad cases, we recommend people tie like birthday balloons, you know, party balloons that are helium balloons float them into a tree, tie them off, that kind of thing. So there's something new, something moving up there to try to disturb them from those perches. But yeah, it's it's a complicated issue and there's not just a, a black and white easy answer for it. Mm. And can you can you briefly ex this, um, explain what you mean by effigies if anybody's not familiar with that, what that means? So uh, effigies basically for turkey vulture or black vultures, either one, it's a good example. Uh, there is a permit process where you can get a permit from USDA and from the Fish and Wildlife Service. It has nothing to do with our state agency. You can get this permit. Uh, they will allow you to shoot these birds. The idea is that you're not gonna shoot your way out of this problem. You're not gonna kill a hundred vultures and not have any vultures on the farm, but they will usually give you between five and 10. Uh, when you have a vulture, the idea is to keep it and literally hang it upside down by its feet around your livestock. Either hang it off the barn, sit it on the roof, hang it off the windmill, whatever. You want other vultures to see this dead vulture hung upside down, and that is an effigy. It works very well for crows. It works good for starlings. It works good for vultures. Hmm. I've never heard that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, as that's news to me. That's, that's so gruesome but effective. Well, and the, the workaround for that is so you can also make a fake effigy. Mm. Uh, if you Google these vultures and effigies, you'll find lots of things. There's government documentation, you know, pamphlets for landowners. I mean, I've had people make them out of like bowling pins and then put rubber wings on them. Hmm. I've had people go to Halloween stores and buy, you know, silly looking big headed vulture legs. Uh, I've made them out of sheets of metal myself where it's just a silhouette. Uh, but yeah, any, and so again, you don't need a permit for a fake effigy. It's just something that looks that way. And so that's something you can do right then. But again, I mean, I've dealt with that with vultures on churches and lake houses and things, uh, you know, we have a Veterans Memorial Cemetery here in town, and they have vultures on top of the monoseums, or, and it's obviously that doesn't look well to the public. Uh, so I mean, we deal with it in all types of situations, but effigies do work. All right, thank you, thank you so much. So um, this, and this is, there's a couple of questions here about trees, and this is something I'm myself am particularly interested in because. Um, as, as a civil pasture researcher, obviously I'm, I'm very keen on integrating livestock with trees, but the question, and I'm not sure we have an academic answer for it. So I'm curious to know if you guys have on the ground experiential answers for, do you think that by incorporating more trees into your pastures, will that deter some avian predators because suddenly the livestock have cover or is it actually increasing avian predators because you're providing more perches and nesting spaces for some of these animals. Does anybody have any thoughts? I don't know if there's an answer for this, so I'm going to leave it open again if, if anybody's got ideas. Well, at least in Missouri, I'd say we've got plenty of trees on most landscapes anyway, so I don't think you're necessarily doing yourself any harm by incorporating trees into pasture, and, and in fact, if uh, if you're managing any young seedlings, I, I actually, it's a positive to have some predator approaches with vole populations and mice and other things that eat, eat some of the small seedling roots and, and even rabbits can damage some, some uh, tree seedling populations. And so in some situations, a predator perch is a positive, uh, just depends on, on the perspective on that issue. But, but again, I go back to my original statement, I think most landscapes and even farms in the state of Missouri have have areas with plenty of trees on them, be my initial thought. Yeah, Petros, I saw, were you gonna jump in? Yeah, um, so for, for me, it's kind of like, what do you want out of your operation, right? So, because if you do, a lot of our ranching here happens in like um, Sherpa Oak land. So there is, there are trees around and there's questions about knocking them down to prevent like red tails or hawks, which are, or eagles, which are more protected in California than other states. Uh, but these raptors also usually tend to do good for ground squirrels, which are a big problem in, in a lot of these areas. So it's either, do you want to risk the idea, at least with not vultures, but with, with active raptors, is it, do you want to encourage these animals there, which will hopefully reduce ground squirrels and then reduce um, livestock with broken limbs because livestock will break their limbs on like holes that the ground squirrels can create and stuff. So it's just a, a conversation that it, it is to be had and you know, it's the positives and negatives and just kind of try and reach the balance of what do you want out of this and what is costing you less or more money and how do you manage that issue uh, specifically. Laura, do you have any any thoughts on on how maybe like habitat changes really affect these dynamics? Yeah, you know, um, Dusty's statement of it depends, I think, is is pretty accurate because a lot of it really does depend on um, specifically what is going on locally and what the goals and objectives are. You know, silvopasture has there's reasons that you do it. And so you're kind of looking at it from the cost benefit analysis in that perspective. Um, you know, and I think, and I think he's absolutely right, especially in the Southern half of the state, like you're hard pressed to find a farm that doesn't have trees on it in, in some way, shape or form, um, whether it's brushy field edges and, and things like that too. And so, you know, I think, um, 
I think there's there's something to be said about that. I mean, the other part of it too, incorporating that kind of natural habitat provides natural foods for predators. And so when you have abundant natural foods, right, the idea is then that you're less likely to experience animals that are taking advantage or, or seeking out those certain types of food sources. You know, like, I mean, I think in, in certain instances, when you've got coyotes that are using the landscape and there's natural foods available and, you know, the coyote that takes advantage of an easy meal, it's not a population issue from the coyote population perspective. It's an individual animal that's exhibiting that behavior. And you'll talk to plenty of other people who are like, well, yeah, the coyotes don't do anything. They use this area and they, you know, and, and like Petra said, they keep some of these other meso animals populations low and things like that. So um, I think I think in many instances, it depends. Now, there certainly have been situations where we've gone and done site visits and you look at it and it's like, well, this tree right here is the reason these animals are getting into your chicken coop or are getting into your barn um, or, you know, having the fence in this location basically creates the corridor for these animals to move into your pasture and stuff like that. So I think there's kind of that localized impact and, and Josh could probably add to that part of it. Yeah. Um, Josh, if you have, if you have any thoughts. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I agree. And that's kind of what I was saying earlier, you know, if there's a dead snag in the middle that's providing nothing, it's just literally still standing, then just knock it down. Uh, I just I've seen that a bunch it used to be a good tree but since it was the one tree in the pasture probably the cows braided around it and stomped all the roots and killed it over time and so it's like then now it's just right in the middle and again yeah uh, and again I think it's again situational you know we have the Missouri river bottoms we have the Mississippi river bottoms you're going to have eagles in those big river bottoms and that's going to be something that will be there forever and you're never going to get that to go away no matter what or you're adjacent to one of our bigger lakes that kind of a thing and uh, you know, again, that's a hard conversation, but sometimes you just kind of have to speak reliably about this will probably always be an issue you will deal with. Well, I got a question about back to the buzzards and the, and the black headed ones. That, what's the difference between the red headed ones and the little black ones? The little black ones just seem so much more aggressive than the red. I mean, the red buzzards have been around for years and years and years. And the little black ones have just kind of started migrating in, but they just seem so aggressive. They'll go after a baby calf. You know, and, and they'll go after his eyes just right yeah. now. So basically, I don't know, I feel like I'm still in the conversation. Uh, turkey vultures are, are native, common, been around forever. Black vultures, some people, you know, adequately or not call them Mexican black vultures or whatever. But yeah, it's just another species of vulture. Just like in, in Missouri, especially, we didn't have armadillos like we do now 30 years ago. They just showed up over time. It's the same thing with the black vultures. They are just making their way north. If you want to call it climate change or range expansion, whatever. The fact is they're showing up and they're becoming more prevalent than what they were. Uh, exactly right. You, you, they, I would call them, people say they're more aggressive or more persistent. Uh, black vultures actually rely more on their eyes, whereas turkey vultures rely on their nose. So it's not even uncommon to have, you know, a roadkill deer, turkey vultures come in and eat it because they smell it rotten. Black vultures come in, run the turkey vultures off of that, that meal, and then they take it over. So exactly, they'll key in more on afterbirth, on all those kinds of things. They're more of a visual predator. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's just another vulture in the vulture family, and they're a more common occurrence than what it used to be. Yeah. Interesting. Well, we're, we're wrapping up here, and um, I think on, on that note, you kind of, you kind of hit on a, a good point, Josh, about how things are constantly changing and how it's important for us all to, to adapt to circumstances. So I kind of want to briefly, like for this final round of questions, Hank, I'm going to start with you. What advice do you have based on your experience for other farmers or ranchers who are struggling with predation loss on their, on their land? Do you have any advice for, for other folks out there? Boy, you know, it's, you just got to do what works for you on your own place. You know, I mean, uh, there ain't nobody else that can fix it. I mean, there's lots of ideas that you can, you can adapt to, but, but not every gate's going to, going to swing the same way, you know? So, I mean, my advice is just, just work, you know, do what you have to do on your place, you know, and, and mother nature's going to take, if you take care of, if you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. But, 
and you know same way with the wildlife you know i mean you gotta you gotta try to control it because it's going to be there and uh you know i mean if you like i said if you if you have a dead pile that you have a lot of carcasses drugged to you're probably going to have a lot of buzzards you know if you have uh you know if you're the pigs you know if you have a big open pen with a lot of soured corn in it the the pigs are going to come i mean so i mean keep your try to try to keep your place where you're not attracting them as much as you can because they're going to come anyway you know so but do whatever works on your own place you know and and listen to other people and take all the advice that you can get because you know you might have to take your advice from a dozen different people to make one thing work so that's that's the that's all I have from uh, Osage County, Oklahoma. Y'all come see us. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you so much. Petros, any, any final last minute advice? Yeah, so um, the landscape is changing. There's a lot of movement, especially with the larger predators. Uh, um, it, it's kind of hard to, to see it, but I tell a lot of people, like you can't waste your time being angry at legislation and at rules that are being made. Um, there's a there's a lot of feeling, especially in California, about ranchers being marginalized and about being put in the back burner and like trying to, you know, constantly hammering them with more protection laws. And whilst it, it you know, you can argue that that's true or not. I just I always say you can't waste your time and energy on that. Try and solve the problems that you have on your land. Um, and like Hank said, whatever works for you, just try try and that's where I usually try and direct the energy from. Like um, you can advocate and you can have it but like just spending all your time being angry isn't going to solve your predator issue right so try and work with what tools you're given with what's within the range of the law uh and a lot of the times that requires innovation so and innovate as much as you can or ask people and you know ideas float around and all these things just pop up every now and then someone says hey this works for me and then it turns out it works for other people so yep wonderful thank you uh laura any any last minute advice I mean, I think every, they've they've covered it pretty well so far. I think the only thing that I would add is, you know, Josh kind of touched on some of these things are the cost of doing business. And, and we deal with it a lot with bears that prevention is a lot easier than responding to specific issues. And so, you know, if somebody can kind of read the writing on the wall and see some of these things are coming, um, you know, try to be proactive so that you're not constantly in a reactive state where you're experiencing those losses and then trying to have to figure out what to do, but you know, if there are situations where where you can take some of that um, advice or methods and try to implement them in a in a proactive sense, I think that always is helpful too. Wonderful, yeah, Josh. Yeah, one quick thing, and then I'll I'll quit. Uh, the other thing is, just because you find a dead cow on your property does not mean it was killed by anything that walks. That's, that's something we run into all the time is there's a dead calf that's a day old and, you know, and maybe even a coyote is ate on it after it died. But it's like uh, the big conversation I have with people, no matter what the animal is, it's like, so what's the mode of death? Did it, did it puncture its brain? Did it bleed it out? Did it, if none of these things happened and it was just fed upon, it wasn't a depredation issue. It was possums eating it or whatever the case may be. And so I think that's something to consider is that things do die on their own, especially things that are fresh born and just something to consider. Again, lots of that is cost of doing business. And if you have questions, then call your conservation agent, call the office. The best thing I can do is usually take a very sharp knife and skin a carcass out and show that there's no bruising on the neck. There's no holes in the head. You know, the animal wasn't killed, it just died. Yeah, wonderful. Um, Dusty, you got any, any final thoughts from, uh, from your direction down at Lork? Yeah, and I think some others have kind of hinted on this. It is about what works, but uh, it's also the fact that there are rules, regulations, and policies in effect for many of what we're talking about. And although some of them, like the black vultures or in Missouri, mount, mountain lion or bears, may be relatively new, don't hesitate to contact your resource professionals in the area. And, I, and I'm targeting the Missouri Department of Conservation as primary role on that in that. Um, because they will work with producers, um, but they can't work with you and work with the policies and the rules that are in place unless they know there's an issue. So it's, it's two edged. You, you work to raise their awareness of issues and they'll work with you to help address that problem on your farm. 
Uh, and a great case in point is the changes in the, in the coyote hunting regulations that allow the nighttime activities now, which is completely new in the state of Missouri, if I understand that correctly, and, and uh, as a hunter in the state anyway. And so, um, you know, be aware of the rules, regulations, and policies, and then work with the professionals um, to help both educate them and to help them help you address an issue. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Thank you so much, Dusty. Josh, Laura, Petros, Hank, thank you so much for giving your time today to talk with us. I hope everybody listening was able to get something from this. I know I I learned I learned about effigies. <laughs> um, it was a I feel like a great conversation. If you have any questions for our guest speakers or for us here at the Center for Agroforestry, please feel free to reach out. Um, we'll do our best to get share information about how best to contact our panelists and uh, help you out if you have any more questions that come up um, when you're tooling around in the shower later and you think of that question that you wish you would ask, you know, so but feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much for your time. Hannah, I'm going to hand it back to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you to everyone on the panel today. This is really interesting.